seeking the Lord's blessing, let's please turn together in our Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. And this morning, as we're continuing our way through this letter to the Galatians, we're going to be looking at verse 10 this morning. Galatians 1 and verse 10. Now, before we begin, let's ask God's blessing in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the time that we can all be gathered before you and hear your word. And we ask that you would grant to each of us what is needed in terms of the work of your spirit, helping us to rightly understand what your word says and to receive it for what it is, which is the word of God given to us for our salvation. Please help us together. And we pray that you would be glorified through this. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10. This is God's holy word. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Now, as you know, there are many things that trouble the heart of a true believer. Many things that burden his soul. Perhaps the greatest burden... The greatest trial, the greatest source of trouble and discouragement is a believer's own sinful nature. A believer loves God. He wants to do what is right. He wants to please God. But he continually encounters failure. The thing he doesn't want to do, he does. And the thing that he wants to do, he doesn't. And it's because there is still sin that remains in his heart. Paul writes later in this letter, For the desires of the flesh are against the desires of the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. It's a great discouragement and a great burden in the heart of a true believer. This conflict troubles true believers. Paul cries out in Romans chapter 7, verse 24, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And the song of a true believer includes the words of Psalm 25, Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions, Forgive all of my sins. See, believers still have sin in their heart, and that troubles them. But then there's another great burden that a true believer faces, and that is the opposition he faces from others when he stands for the truth, when he speaks the truth of God, even when he does so out of love and concern for others. And there's that great troubling burden in the heart of a true believer when there is a fear to stand for the Lord, a fear due to the consequences. And those times when a believer doesn't speak the truth, withholds what he knows he should say, holds back, and then his burden in his soul. Or when he does speak the truth, the response, the consequence, is an enmity. An unpleasant response. Some of you know what that is like. Some of you have been members in other churches where God's word was not being followed. Where the whole counsel of God was not being taught. And when you attempted to take a stand for the truth, for God's glory and honor, and for the good of your brothers and sisters, you were treated as the troublemaker. You were treated as the problem. 
friends and perhaps even family members no longer wanted to be around you simply because you desire to stand for the truth because you wanted to please God. Now the Apostle Paul experienced this burden as well. Even from these churches at Galatia to whom he's writing this letter. Paul's going to say later in this very letter, chapter 4, verse 16, he's going to say this, Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? Can you imagine? These are the words from the Apostle Paul in anguish because he was reminding the Galatians how they used to feel about him. When he first preached the gospel... He says, you received me like an angel of God. What do you think that looked like when people receive someone as if they're an angel of God? He goes on to say, you loved me so much that if possible, you would have gouged out your own eyes and given them to me. That's how much you used to love me. And then he says, have I become your enemy? Because I'm telling you the truth? You see, this is a burden that true believers often face. Friends, family, other church members turn against them, turn against a true believer for standing for the truth. And because of this, there is this temptation for a true believer to compromise the truth, to keep his mouth closed and to go along with what is being said or what is being done in order not to bring these unpleasant consequences. There is this temptation to have the approval of man. A temptation to please men even when in the heart he knows this doesn't please God. Have any of you been there? Now you remember from last week that Paul says what are perhaps the most strongest words and most offensive words that the world would ever hear in verses 8 and 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Is that going to be pleasing to First Nations? Is that going to be pleasing to the Muslims? Is that going to be pleasing to the Buddhists? Is that going to be pleasing to the Hindus? Is that going to be pleasing to the atheists, to the transgender? Is that going to be pleasing? No. Is that going to be pleasing to the Orthodox, to the Roman Catholic? No. These are clear words. To some ears, they would be regarded as harsh words. And this is why Paul says that in order for him to be a servant of Christ, he must not compromise the truth, even if this doesn't please Man, Again, look at that first part of verse 10. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? You know, being a people pleaser is something that all of us succumb to. Have you ever done something or said something or gone along with something because that's what everyone else is saying, that's what everyone else is doing, that's what everyone else is believing. And you fear the disapproval of these other people. Again, perhaps the clearest example or trend today in our culture, in our world, has to be the transgender movement. Now, of course, there are many other, other uh, things that are taking place. But this is perhaps one of the clearest example. People know that this is madness. People know that. This is ridiculous. This is insanity. It's absurd. Males are not females. And females are not males. 
That's not reality. But this movement has taken control of the media through propaganda and through big money into the school system. And they've managed to press this agenda so that the entire society says this is the only way that you will be accepted or approved by society. And everyone goes along with it because of fear, the fear of man. But you know, it happens in many different ways. You think about it in your own workplace. When you hear things around the office or in the workplace and that constant burden, that plaguing, just like you know, Lot had when he was living in Sodom, how his soul was vexed day after day when he saw what was taking place around him. And there's that burden when you get home and you're thinking, why didn't I say something? Why couldn't I have been a better witness? Why didn't I take a stand for the truth? Is it because... I'm so concerned with offending someone or not pleasing them and yet knowing that I'm not pleasing God. It's a terrible burden that Christians experience, a terrible wrestling. And when it comes to the gospel itself, salvation by free grace, just as there were in Paul's days, you know, those who stated that salvation is not of God's work alone, you know, that there were and continue to be those who teach that salvation is a joint effort. It's a joint effort. God does most of the work, but you have to do the rest. Right? In Paul's day, it was the Judaizers, the Jewish Christians who said, if the Gentiles want to become Christians, then they need to be circumcised and they need to observe the ceremonial law of Moses. Faith in Jesus is not enough to become a righteous person. You must also add some works. And here are some of the works that you must do. The same lie developed in the church, in Orthodoxy, the Eastern Church, in Roman Catholicism, in the Western Church. Faith plus works, that's what makes you righteous. In the Protestant Church, the Arminians push the same thing. God makes salvation possible, but it depends upon you to be saved. Billy Graham, you know, he used to say the Billy Graham, uh, what do they call them, crusades, right? That's politically incorrect. Right? But uh, Billy Graham, God casts a vote for you. The devil casts a vo vote against you. You cast the deciding vote. You see, it all sits it's in your hands. Salvation is up to you. In order for you to be saved, you must use your free will and choose God. And you could lose your salvation if you stop using your free will to choose God. So ultimately, it's all upon you. In the Reformed churches, as you know, there was the federal vision movement where men were teaching that God saves by grace, but a person is preserved in grace by his own faithfulness. Others were teaching that the sacraments were not merely means of grace as signs and seals, but means of grace as actually conveying grace. For example, withholding the Lord's Supper from an infant was thought to be or taught to be withholding grace from an infant rather than a means of grace. From an infant. Those are two entirely different things. That infants were being kept from actual spiritual nourishment, actual grace. We starve our infant children if we withhold the Lord's Supper from them. It's another way of saying that this work needs to be done in order to perfect salvation. It needs to, we need to contribute this to convey salvation. But you see, the gospel is all about free grace, and it's of grace from beginning to end. Salvation is by God's grace alone through faith alone. We don't add or contribute anything, and this is what Paul was preaching. And it was a, a, a fearful thing to do, 
because there are many in the church who violently oppose that. And so Paul says, am I seeking the approval of man or of God? And it's, re- it's very interesting, embedded in these words, you know, is the idea that people were saying, Paul, you're just trying to make it too easy on the Gentiles. Right? Here are all these Gentiles. You just want to grow. This is your church growth movement, Paul. You know, you can become a Christian. You don't need to be circumcised. I know that's unpopular. You don't want to do that. So come on in. You don't have to do I know the uh, ceremonial law is kind of a burden. We, you don't need to do that. Just come on in. The faith is all you need. You're just trying to make it easy on the Gentiles, Paul, because you want to please them. You're popular among the Gentiles. And Paul's saying, am I seeking to please men or God? The reason why I preach the gospel by grace alone is because this is what the gospel is. It's by grace alone. There are some who are people pleasers. And we must understand, of course, that there is some people pleasing that is good. And it's right before God. There's a certain kind of people pleasing that is good and right before God. We read about what Jesus was like when he was growing up from his teenage years into becoming an adult, right? In Luke 2, verse 52, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus grew in favor with man. People were pleased with him. He was a good young man. He was obedient to his parents. He was a good hard worker. He was a faithful friend. He was an excellent brother. He pleased people. Jesus did good to people. He sought to please others. Romans 15, verses 2 and 3, it says, Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up, for Christ did not please himself. And the Apostle Paul also engaged in this uh, good kind of man-pleasing. Paul writes, Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything, I do not, see, not, seeking my, I do not seek my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. It says that in 1 Corinthians 10, 32 and 33. The Apostle Paul would give up his personal rights in order to win others to Christ. And so he would do things that would be pleasing or would have the approval of others so that he would win them to Christ. He says in 1 Corinthians 9.20, To the Jews I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To the, those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law, but under the law of Christ, that I might win some of those outside of the law. He says, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might win some to Christ. That's the kind of good man-pleasing, right? Not being offensive, not putting unnecessarily, unnecessary blocks before others becoming all things to all men. Now, Paul, of course, does not mean that he would become a drug dealer in order to win drug dealers or a gambler or a prostitute in order to save gamblers and prostitutes. He's telling us about giving up his own personal rights in the use of lawful things to help others come to the Lord or to help keep others from sinning against the Lord. And so... If Paul thought that dressing like a Jewish rabbi would make the Gentiles resist listening to him, then he would put on Gentile clothing. If he thought wearing the clothing of a rabbi would be helpful when he went into a Jewish synagogue, then he would put on the rabbi clothing and walk into the synagogue. He didn't have to do either of these but he did it so that others would not be offended. That's the kind of good man-pleasing or a good kind of 
winning, as it were, the approval of men. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 24, let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. And if his ultimate good is salvation and growth in grace and being built up, then of course you will do things for the sake of another to please them, as it were. Someone says to you, he says, someone says to you, this has been offered and sacrificed. Then don't eat it. Don't eat it. Don't upset that person. Right? That's a form of men-pleasing, as it were, good men-pleasing. And so there is a form of good men-pleasing. That's not what Paul is referring to here. Paul's referring to that men-pleasing which actually displeases God. See, there is a man-pleasing that is not good because it is a pleasing or a displeasing of God. And people-pleasing must always be subservient to serving and pleasing God. Someone once illustrated this by using the example of a hotel manager, right? A hotel manager works for the owner of the hotel, and the owner of the hotel says, now I want you to please the customer, right? The customer is always right. So whatever they ask you to do, then do that for the customer. That's my direction. But, of course, if the customer starts loading up his car with furniture from the room or starts destroying the room, then the manager's going to say, you have to stop that or I'm calling the police, even though that wouldn't be what the customer wants. And he does that because he knows that he's a servant to the owner of the hotel according to the rules of the hotel. And so it is when it comes to God's truth and a believer's relationship to the Lord as a servant of Christ As a servant of Christ, Paul in Galatians 1 says, I must please Christ above all, and I must speak the truth without equivocation, without compromise, and that is regardless of whether or not that pleases or displeases my fellow man. Now, again, this is hard to do because... We fear the consequences. We know the intimidation. We want to avoid an angry response. We want to avoid arguments. We want to remain well thought of, not be the person who causes trouble. Let's let everybody get along fine. And you know, there's a very important verse that I'd like for you to turn with me to, sh- to, to really see how this plays out. If you turn to John chapter 12, verse 42, the Gospel of God, John chapter 12 and verse 42. Notice what it says here. <clears throat> Here's a response of many who have been observing Jesus. And it says here in verse 42, Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. Many believed in Jesus, even of the authorities. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. You see there, they, they believed in Jesus in their heart. This really is the Son of God. This is the Savior. Here's the Lord. They believed that in their heart, but they wouldn't say it. They wouldn't proclaim it. They wouldn't speak it because they were afraid of being put out of the synagogue. That's what they were afraid of. And it wasn't a fear of being beat up, you know, of being pounded. It was a fear of being put out of the synagogue. How do we know that? Because of what we read in verse 43. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. This is why they were afraid of being put out of the synagogue, because in the synagogue, they loved all the seats of honor, right? The special chairs at the front by the pulpit. They liked to be able to stand up before the synagogue, and to pray long prayers and to think about, oh, listen to how uh, Rabbi Judah pre- preaches. That's a Jewish name. I 
Apollos. He, he, he's just so, uh, so eloquent in his words. Many of the Pharisees and those who were in the synagogue, they, they liked the approval of men that took place in the synagogue as they would pray, as they would speak, as they would offer their tithes and offerings. Here's what I'm giving. And others would look at them and think, oh, that's so wonderful. And they didn't want to be removed from that place where they would get praise from man. That's what they were afraid of. They would rather not say what they believed in their heart to be true because they didn't want others to think less of them. They wanted to keep the praise of man. Now this is precisely what we find as well in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10. And I want you to notice something that's found here in verse 43 that is also found in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10. Because here in verse 43 it says, For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And in Galatians chapter 10 he says, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? What do we see here? That there are things that please man, which at the same time displease God. And there are things that displease God, which at the same time please man. They are mutually exclusive. And to choose to please one party means that you will be displeasing the other party. That's what's obvious here. And I want you to notice here, again in verse 43, and here in Galatians 1.10, that God does recognize those who please him. And God will one day openly acknowledge those who please him. You see there? There's a glory that comes from God, just as there's a glory that comes from man. What is the glory that comes from man that these people like so much? What is the glory that comes from man? Oh, just hearing about so-and-so is such a holy, holy person, right? Look how great this person is. You're such a blessing. You're so, so smart, so good, so kind. A glory that comes from man, the praises of man. But there is a glory that comes from God. Now, the glory that comes from man, the praise that comes from man, is a reward that comes in this life, here and now. Whereas the glory that comes from God is a glory that comes in heaven in the future. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about uh, these two different rewards, these two different kinds of glory. Uh, that which is in this life from man and that reward which comes from God. He says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven, Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. See, the praise of man, that was their reward. That's why they did it. And that's what they received for it. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Will reward you. There is a glory that comes from God. It comes in the future when the Lord says, Well done, good and faithful servant. You sought to please me. You sought to serve me. You stood for my truth. You are not seeking the praise and approval of man. Again, it's not easy. And the true believer constantly faces the temptation 
to withhold his tongue, to not speak. But he knows that he can't. And he also knows the experience of what happens when he does speak, like Jeremiah. And there's that constant tension, how he wants to speak the truth, and yet when he does, he is constantly ridiculed, he is constantly tortured for it. This is a burden that a believer faces. In conclusion, what I want to remind you of, as believers in Jesus Christ, those who would seek to please God, what I want you to remind you of is that not only does standing for God's truth being uncompromising in what the Word of God says. Not only is that pleasing to God, what you have to remember is that it is actually good for your fellow man. It's good for your fellow man. Although what you stand for, what you believe, what you would say to men, since it is the Word of God, although you know it will not please them, that does not mean that it's not good for them. It is good for them. Many medicines are bitter. Many medical procedures are painful, but they are for good, and you must always remember that. It's not merely, not merely, although that would be sufficient to please God, but also remember that ultimately this is for the good of your neighbor and it is an expression of real love for them well may the lord give us strength as it is our desire to not seek the praise of men but the praise of god let's pray our father in heaven we live in a time when your truth is far and spread abroad in such a way that it is hard to find. It is less available and prevalent as it used to be in times past, and we pray that you would be pleased <clears throat> to once again grant that your word would come forth in its power and prominence in our land. Lord, we pray that you would help each of us as your servants and as our hearts desire to do, to be faithful witnesses to you, that in our conduct and in our speech, we would be those kinds of servants who would please men in a right way, not causing unnecessary offense, but at the same time, not being a man pleaser in the wrong way where we would not speak the truth when it needs to be spoken. We pray for your help from power from your spirit and that you would bless our word and witness. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.